already we are thank you um so this session will be recorded just so that you are aware of that so if you wish to if you if you wish to hide uh you you are most welcome to to cut your video but we are mm -hmm. i'm going to ask everyone to please keep their videos on because at the moment we are such a small audience and this will be a very intimate conversation so because of that, it will be lovely to be able to see people's faces while we're having this wonderful conversation. So please um, uh, keep your videos on if you can. However, please uh, keep your sound on mute throughout the presentation so that we don't have any background noises uh, interfering with the presentation that's going to be taking place this evening. So please keep your sound on mute throughout the presentation. However, I do encourage you to use the chat function, which is at the bottom of your screen, to write down your questions and comments to us. So throughout the event, please post your questions to us. And then towards the end of the event, we will have a Q&A session where our guest and our speaker will address your questions and your comments. So please make sure you do that. If you have a question, just put it on the chat. So good evening to all of you and welcome to this um, webinar event hosted by the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center in partnership with the Zilt Foundation, or as some people pronounce it, the Zilt Foundation. <laughs> um, <laughs> and welcome to our, uh, I think it's our fourth, now our fourth um, series, our fourth artist presentation and event. And this event forms part of our partnership and bi-monthly series of presentations where we present to you extraordinary artists from all over the world and various forms of artistic endeavors and focuses to present their groundbreaking and important work. So just to tell you a little bit about the SILT Foundation before I officially hand over and begin the webinar. So the SILT Foundation initiates and supports innovative contemporary literary, visual art and performance projects with the aim to encourage cultural dialogue and artistic interaction. Tonight's event is titled, This Murmur of Shards, a conversation with and poetry reading with Raina Rene Mueller. So tonight we are thrilled to present uh, poet Raina uh, Mueller, who will be reading some of his poetry to us and also will be honored to listen in on a conversation, an interview that he will be having with uh, literary scholar Indra Uso from the Silt Foundation. Towards the end of the, the event, we will have a Q&A session once again. So um, throughout the presentations and the conversation, please post your questions. Just to tell you a little bit about Rainer Rene Mueller. So Rene, um, Rainer was born in the city of, this is going to be difficult for me, Wurzburg. Wurzburg. <laughs> yeah. Wurzburg in um, Bavaria in 1949. He lived in France and lives in Heidelberg today. He studied German philosophy, um, French philosophy, theology, and art history. And since the 60s, Rainer has published poetry while working as a freelance publicist and tutor for adult education. He has also published many books of poetry in Germany and was awarded the Gallinger, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, the Gallinger Poetry Award in 2016. In 2021, an anthology of his poetry will be published in the renowned Wallstein Publishing House, edited by Chiara Caradona and Leonard Keidel. <laughs> <laughs> and so it is my honor, it is my pleasure to, in, to present um, uh, Rainer Rene Mueller to begin this session with a poetry reading um, of the poem uh, Vege Vege, translated as parts, parts. So um, over to you right now. That means I should start, yes? Yes. Yes, please. 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 I first read in German. 
And then the English translation. Wege, Wege. Geräusche. Das Wort Überlebensschuld. Etwas unterbricht uns, verursacht diesen Gesang. Scherbengeplär, Lessingland, ein prologisches Blau. Alles haben wir gesehen, das Verpfiffene, den Gehängten, der schlug gegen den Wind, der ging am Stationenweg um ein Armen zu viel, dieses Bütteltarock. Alles haben wir getrunken, Fahrt, das Bleiweiß, der Ausfluss, aus der Thomas-Seite, im überdauerten, bewachten Schlaf, dieses Schlaflos. Die linke Seite war die Todesseite, die rechte Seite war die Arbeitsseite. Rabbinisches, mein Traum vom Schneider in New York. Wer heilt das? <lacht> Now I try the English version. <clears throat> pass, pass. Add in this gospel of survivor's guilt. Something undercuts us, necessitates this choir, this murmur of shards, blessing splendor prologue blue. We have witnessed everything, the squealed on truth, the hanged man bellowing in the wind, who went the way of the cross for one superfluous amen, a torturing by turret. We have drunk everything, the bleached out laden white, the discharge issuing from the Thomas side, in the guarded sleep overcome us, pardon, in the, over, in the guarded sleep overcome by us, there's a fateful sleep ticket. The left was the side of death, the right was the side of work. Rabbinical, my dream of the tailor in New York. Who might feel this? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rainer. And so at this time, I would like to present Indra to welcome Rainer and also to give us some background information and knowledge about this partnership. Yeah, so um, a very warm welcome from my side as well. And thank you so much, Rainer. Um, this is a very, very important event for me, actually something I was hoping that we can have it, even though we didn't know with a, with a language, we might have the problem that because we couldn't do it in English. Um, I met Rainer actually by chance when I was in Heidelberg, as my publisher is actually also in Heidelberg, and I wrote an article about the city of literature that Heidelberg was supposed to become then um, for a South African art magazine. And I visited this tiny, tiny little bookshop, um, Artis Liberalis, the free arts, that was um, by Clemens Bellut. And while I entered this little bookshop, there was Rainer sitting there and I was immediately hooked by his presence and we talked and he gave me this precious, precious, precious little book of poetry of his. And from that moment on, it was, I think in 2017. 17. I, yeah, I felt, oh, we have to do something together. And then unfortunately came COVID, but I'm so, so happy that with Zoom, we have the chance to really work together and show his poetry also in English. The translation that was done actually by Chalkia Nudir, another poet, a South African poet and colleague of Rainer, 
um, who has been working for the Zilt Foundation for several other occasions. And I hope that in the future, we will also work together with Raina on a project, but we will talk about this later. As I said, because we thought we do the interview in German, we don't do it now, but because I could travel after 18 months, finally travel again in July, Rainer and me met in July in Heidelberg in that bookshop again, and we made the interview, which will be two parts, and we will now see the first part, and then we hear another poem, then we have the second part, another poem, and then a conversation. Mr. Muller, good day. May I? Yes, of course. You are not disturbing my reading. What are you currently reading? Georg Philipp Hasdorfer's Kunstverstandige Diskurs, Die Wissenschaft der Frühen Neuzeit. Yes, from the series Contributions to Art and Literature. This is exactly what preoccupies me. Yes, you are, after all, at home between art and literature. Maybe just tell us a bit about yourself, where you are from, where do you live? Let's start at the end. I am currently living in Heidelberg. I came here when I was seven years old. This is also where I grew up. From my mother's side, I am Jewish. This is something I have written about. This line comes from Chernowitz through my grandmother. Talking about Chernowitz, that means you grew up with literature. With my grandmother, yes. She was an interesting type of person. One who, just like the grandmother in Gunter Groot's famous novel The Tin Drum, sits on the ground. She was a woman who really worked with the soil and later lived off the land. But at the same time, she was a very worldly, wise and cultured woman. It sounds like an anecdote, but let me tell more then it will make more sense to you. She told me as a small boy already, I was about six or seven. She said to me, Ray Neely, Ray Neely, you are the golden one. You must read, you must read so you can become a famous man. And then she bought books in Potsdam in the old DDR. One must just imagine this happened in 1953. All kinds of books, Schopenhauer, The Pocket Oracle by Grafian, two volumes by Sholokhov and Quiet Flows the Dong, Apuleius, The Golden Ass, which was a kind of erotica, all such things. Whatever she could get, she bought and gave to me. Um. I'm going to stop a little bit. Indra, you wanted to say something? Um, I completely forgot to tell in all this excitement that this is a very interesting way of how we did. We did the translation, of course, ourselves, but what we tried is we used um, artificial intelligence speech. So bear in mind that some of the names are not pronounced as good as they possible. And of course, also the times are not. So sometimes there is a German while still there is no English. And it seems that the English is much shorter than the German, which is actually not because the content is done by a human and the content is done according to what it said. There are simply, you know, sometimes there is repetitions and some that the English is shorter than the German anyway. I just wanted you to know how this production was made. <laughs> and of course, it's not a professional one. It's what we could do in this short time and with our capacities. So yeah, that's, I forgot to say this because I feel that it's quite important. So, All right. so oh. thank you. All right.
I could give a whole lecture about this, what it means for a child in a specific situation to know about its origins. But let's leave it. That one thing I can say, the foundations for what I do today, and what has accompanied me all my life, were already laid there. Das mache, was ich mache und immer das gemacht habe, was mein ganzes Leben begleitet hat, war da schon grundgelegt. There were always two things, the world that can be read and the world that manifests itself in images. These two realms have been decisive for everything. And later music also played a role. That was later in the 70s. Yes, that's how it was. Yes. Yes, I'm getting the order right. I came back from Freiburg and in 72 slash 73 back here. And then there was the friendship with Hans. We used to visit each other alternately once a week, always in the same setting. We spoke about all kinds of things, political philosophy, aesthetics, music, always just one topic. At that time, there was a renewed interest in Mahler in Germany. And from there, it wasn't a big leap back to romantic piano music like Schubert. And then we went a bit back in history. And then for me, the more modern music, not all of it. The music festival in Donaueschingen did not convince me, but specific pieces of newer music, like the incredible adaptation by Korchiger Beckett's Endgame, which was premiered in Milan, which I watched on TV. And so it spanned a whole range of things. And reading, I have always read, as I have said anecdotally, coming from a completely broken family, reading represented the possibility to remain inwardly strong, not just metaphorically, but also something to help me survive within the structure of family. It played a huge role. How is it when one reads so much and approaches the world of reading and also in images? When does one start living these images and words? When does one begin to write them oneself? In der ich da aufgewachsen bin. Da hat es sagt, die Bücher oder die Musik oder hat da keine Rolle gespielt. Ähm, für mich wurde das, hat sich das, wie soll ich sagen? It probably depends on the social environment. Except for my grandmother, I grew up in an illiterate house and family. Music and books played no role. For me, the point at which a person thinks about what they read about and how that was made, and that it is not just simply there, but that someone must have made that. And that one should be able to do this also. There was a specific point in my life. I am old enough to tell anecdotes. I was barely seven. That was when I was still in Curlstadt. There I was. My mother was a professional photographer, and she had seasonal work in Krim in Upper Bavaria. She took her little boy with her. During the day she worked and I was alone and walked around. It was in the 1950s and Krim was a small health resort and nothing much was going on. And there I made myself an artist seasonal from the planks from the packaging of photographic paper in the laboratory. Then I took this easel into the wheat fields. I had watercolors. 
And so the little boy stood in the grass meadows and did watercolors of the mountains. It was my first attempt to translate something I saw into something that I knew was a picture. No one had explained that to me. No one said, you should do so or so. Auf etwas zu übertragen, von dem ich wusste, es ist ein Bild. Das hat mir ja nie jemand erklärt. Das hat niemand gesagt, du musst das so oder so oder das nicht. Nein, nein. Also zum Beispiel. Und die Schrei schreiben, schreiben als Form des verheimlichten Selbstausdrucks ein bisschen später. Ich war so elf, zwölf war ich. Da habe ich gedacht, ich muss jetzt einen Roman schreiben. Also, writing as a form of hidden self-expression came a bit later, when I was 11 or 12. And then I thought I must write a novel. I didn't know what that was exactly. I knew what it looked like. So I had thought something up. Sometimes it preoccupies me as a model till today. I had thought up the plot, even though I didn't know that word. The plot was that an old man was visited by a boy. The old man was visited by a boy, and the old man talks to the boy and explains something. And in that, the old man tells the boy about when he was the same age. And the boy writes it down as if they were his own memories. That was the story I had thought of. I wrote a few pages, just the way I thought one should write. And of course it did not work. But this idea, but this was the first time that I had an idea that through writing you can create something that is readable and design something that extrinsically does not exist. Das war zum ersten Mal, dass ich eine Vorstellung hatte von dem, dass man mit dem Geschriebenen etwas herstellen kann, das lesbar ist und etwas gestaltet, aufbaut, was außerhalb nicht vorhanden ist, sondern so. Im What is interesting, what I thought about while listening are the different layers of memory, where it is not a real distinction between the own and the other, but what is epigenetically within us. Ja, ja, ja. Also das, diese Sache ist, ist mir sehr, in, in, also sehr klar. Ich habe auch noch also, interessant, dann vom Erleben her, wenn der, der, so ein Junge, der... Yes, yes, this memory is very vivid, interesting just from the perspective of experience, as a boy. I grew up partly in Potsdam in a barracks camp on what was called the Potsdam Rue Enen Barg. It is not far from San Susi, Rue Enen Barg. After the war, there was a barrack camp there. I think one had taken it over from some previous time. A barracks camp. Some of the people like my parents and grandparents, who were driven out in 1946 from Czechoslovakia, were partly accommodated there. It is where I spent some of my childhood under impossible circumstances. There was electricity, but no running water and no toilets. Wood fires. Just leave it. Bag, just leave it. In these barracks there was this old person, the old runkle. He used to sit in the corner and chew tobacco and then he would spit it out. And I sat there a lot because I was always left alone. Always alone. Then one looked around. I always had a good imagination. Probably out of necessity because I never got anything visual or as nourishment. Those are the stories. At 12, I wrote my first testament. But that was very early. 
Dann war mir schon dann deutlich geworden, dass ich in der Familie nichts mehr wird. It was early because it was clear that, that in that family I would become nothing. I had already, so to speak, survived some of the first episodes of suffering already. That's another story. In one of my poems in the collection Jeskri Ebenes, there is a passage where there is a fictitious quotation, it would have been better if one had stuffed you with coal and set you alight. But that is real, it is not a fictional picture. Or suffocate someone with a sack over the head, please leave me in peace. Und es sind drei, oder jemand ersticken mit einem Sack, also bitte, lass mich in Ruhe. Übrigens, wenn wir dann von Gedichten sprechen, es gibt im Grunde in keinem Gedicht, auch wenn es aufs erste Wesen so scheint, die geografischen Angaben stimmen immer, äh, sondern lokale Ortsbezeichnungen stimmen immer, Landschafts- oder Baulichkeitsangaben stimmen immer, botanische Angaben oder Fauna, es ist immer, stimmt immer. Und auch unglaublichste Bilder, die zunächst so unglaublich erscheinen. Speaking about my poems, there is no poem, even if it seems like it, the geographical details are always true, the locations are always true. Landscape and buildings are always true. Botanical details or fauna are always true. Also, the images that might seem unbelievable always correspond to or are taken from a lived or survived reality. It is not an invention. In the beginning of the 1970s, when it became clear what I wanted to do, and more precisely what I didn't want under any circumstances, there was a stage when, one could say, literature was very polemical and the poem makers were using very simplified formulae of depiction, to put it neutrally. There were certain reasons for this, but which don't really interest me. There was so much invention, that I was no longer interested. I experienced it as untrue, and I did not want anything to do with it. Because the attitude of the poem did not correspond with the real life of the young people of my generation. It wasn't true and there was a lot of lying in it. And because until my 30th and 32nd year I had been permanently living within a construct of lies, of untruth, of not being able to trust, it was important that in the form I had chosen to do what I wanted to do, that things should be as true as possible. <laughs> im Grunde permanent in einem Gefüge der Lüge, der Unwahrheit, des Nicht-Vertrauen-Könnens gelebt haben, war mir zumindest in der Form, in der ich das mache, was mir, was ich machen möchte, wichtig, dass da die Dinge nach den Möglichkeiten, die man hat, wahr sind. One can say that there is a search for truthfulness in your writing. Es war eine Suche nach der Wahrhaftigkeit im Bereich der Kunst. Das hat sich dann rasch erweitert. Es betraf die literarische Kunst, es betraf die bildende Kunst. Ähm, dass es darum ging. It was a search for truthfulness in the sphere of the arts. It quickly expanded. It touched the literary arts and the visual arts. It was about how far the appearance of that which we hear, read and see, is from what it set out to be or from what it claims to be, if that did not correspond. I left it alone. And I tried to walk a path which allowed me to notice the dialogue between the different arts as an aesthetic space. Also as the conversations that works of art in an exhibition or museum have with each other. I have always built up exhibitions. Auch die Unterhaltung, die Kunstwerke in einem Museum oder einer Ausstellung oder so miteinander führen. Ich habe auch Ausstellungen später dann immer so gebaut, dass die. You were also a curator. Ja, ja, das war ja mein Leben geworden. Ich habe ja mit, ich habe ja, ich wollte unabhängig sein auf der primären Ebene, finanziell unabhängig und immer bestimmen, was ich mache und nicht abhängig sein. Dass mir jemand sagt, du musst das machen oder machen Sie das so oder machen Sie das so. Das war mit mir nicht zu machen. Schon seit dem yes, Zeitraum. that became my life. 
I wanted to be independent on a basic level, financially and always determine what I do, not to be dependent so that someone tells me how things should be done. That has never worked even when I was a child. Also not at school. I wanted to set up my own exhibitions and it was probably gifted in this area. I started very early with it. I also wrote about art very early on and was noticed because I wrote in a way that others didn't and this opened a path into this field. I often curated exhibitions in a way that, at least for me, they had a kind of chamber music orchestration. So that during more intimate guided tours and in small gallery conversations, I could tell the viewers why this hangs there or that stands there. What is that? How does that work? Why did I choose this one and not another? This played a big role. And in this way, I was very successful and I managed to stay independent as a writer. Publishers asked if I wanted to publish with them and I did not do it because at a certain point it was clear to me that I could not determine the appearance of the text on the page. It was clear to me that a poem is not just a written sounded creation but that it is important how it is printed, how it looks and how much space it has around it. What comes next? All kinds of things like that. Ein Gedicht ist nicht nur ein geschriebenes, lautliches Gebilde, sondern es ist entscheidend, in welcher Art es gedruckt ist, es ist entscheidend, wie es steht, äh, wie viel Platz drumherum ist, was als nächstes kommt, lauter so Sachen. Maybe we show what your book looks like. You show us how the visuals work in the poems. I had to fight with Angela. Fourth with Angela. Ursula and Jenna is one of the publishers who are very generous with his authors, and still one can imagine what constraints there are behind it all. Yes, I resisted so hard against the format, and then everything was fine. Then everything was fine. Everything was fine. But our series is also about where does one belong? What is important? What is truthful? And the idea that one is at home in both, in poetry and in the visual, that this can also be a lonely place. Yes, talking about the visual and what is important and what is truthful, what could one do with the truth? I want to stick a note onto this page quickly. Wow, thank you for that. Um, and at this point in time, I would like to invite Raina to, to read us another poem. Oh, uh, I think your sound is muted. I shall be yes. back now. It's yes. okay. Yes. I see. It's it's not easy for me to to read. But Inra wanted that I should read. Vaterland. Kornblumen blau. Die denken viel, die Stimmen verbieten, die Farbe blau, diese Farbe, die Stimmen verbietet. Gebrüll, starken Hecheln, Hüten, Überhänge von Proche-Orient, Creuset, Grevet. Exilreden hinlagern. Schrie nicht im Lustgarten die Stimme, die Goebbels Gosche, zu tausenden Stimmen, die gafften, wir haben, wir haben sie zu Paaren getrieben, heilig und paarig. Trieb es hoch die Hand, 
aus und schlug. Mal sind die Stimmen auch nah und ganz blau. Sie sagen, du kommst nicht vor, ich nicht und machen aus Stille ein Tier. Es ist ein Verhör in der Luft, ein Auge ist in der Luft. Die Rüben sind eingemietet, ein Hochbunker steht, lauscht. I will try the English version. Just a moment. There, yeah. I see, I, I see. <clears throat> Vaterland, Cornflower Blue. They think much for big voices. The color blue, this color that forbids voices below. Staking, herding, panting, overhangs of Proche Orient, Creuset, Crevet embedded the speeches of exile. Did not scream in the Lustgarten the voice, the goblets gop to thousands of voices. They gawked, we have, we have driven them into pairs, holy and painting, driven it high the hands swung it back and hit. Sometimes the voices are nearby and completely blue drunk. They say, you don't exist, not I, and make an animal of silence. There's interrogation in the air. When I sit high up, The sugar beads are buried. A Hochbunker stands, listens. Thank you. Thank you so much. That translation was done by Maren Bodenstein, another South African poet that you, some of you already know because she translated the Lugalais poetry into English. Um, actually, our series, the name is Voices of Belonging and Resistance. And as we heard in the first part of the interview, the excellence and interdisciplinary fluidity in which Rainer René Müller expresses himself and infuses his work with, um, we chose, or as he says, I chose the Vaterland Cornflower Blue because I felt it explains the second part of our conversation as it informs his, where his poetry comes from. So I felt I'm very happy that we could hear it. So maybe we do the second part now. zuvor und das war schon nicht leicht. Ich erlebe, seit ich in Heidelberg bin, also sage ich aus, nicht jetzt von der frühen Kindheit her, sondern als ich nach meinem Wechsel von Frankreich wieder zurück nach Heidelberg. Also Maybe it is most skillful again to start with the status quo, start from the now. It is currently more difficult than before, and that was already not easy. Since I have returned to Heidelberg from France for health reasons, I have been permanently exposed to resentment. T. Here are other words I could use, but I don't like them. I constantly experience objections, hatred, unclean speech, stupid jokes, 
and even massive threats. This I have all experienced in Heidelberg, really big. But this has made me more resolved to let my real origins blossom. I have turned more decisively to my Jewish origins, to Jewish identity, also in the quiet towards Jewish thought. Let's call it liturgical thinking, scripture-based, specific laws of Jewish life. I do not have to cook kosher food. I don't mean that. I see myself as an enlightened liberal, but very linked to the committed life of the faith of the fathers. I pay attention to specific things and am at home in this world after a long, long time. It of course also has specific consequences. In my later years, it has partly determined my poetry. Und bin für mich in, diesem, in dieser Welt zu Hause, nach langer, langer Zeit. Es hat natürlich bestimmte Konsequenzen. Es bestimmt in den späten Jahren jetzt teilweise auch meine Dichtung. Die öffentliche Diskussion gegenwärtig in der Bundesrepublik da hat sich ja in den letzten drei, vier Jahren Verschiedenes verändert. Die Aggressionen haben zugenommen. Auch die positive Aggression hat zugenommen. Ich will ein Beispiel machen. Ich bin mehr befreundet. The public discourse currently in Germany has changed in the last two to three years. The aggression has increased. Also, the positive aggression has increased. For example, I am, maybe befriended is putting it strongly, but well acquainted with Max Chorlock, we have worked together a bit. His work goes a tiny bit too far. The strong polemic of Chorlock, his historically unclear thoughts I don't like at all. His essays are unsatisfactory and his public appearances, at least in my opinion, does damage to the cause. I do not believe in the implementation of any societally anchored social ethical program towards tolerance. That word does not fit at all. One can't use it here. Maybe acceptance, or how should I say, normality. Toleranz, das Wort passiert auch nicht, das kann man hier gar nicht äh, verwenden. Eben Akzeptanz oder, wie soll ich das sagen, Normalität, das ist mir klar. Isn't it that if we need to speak about tolerance, there is no normality? Nein, nein, das ist überhaupt nicht normal. Und, und das spüre ich sehr stark. Und alles, was an öffentlichen Bekenntnissen, diese kalendermäßigen Wiederholungen... It is not normal at all. And this I sense strongly. I deeply detest everything that is public confessions, these calendar-type repetitions of, say, the 8th of November, Christ all night, the liberation of Auschwitz or other anniversaries and everything around this that is done publicly, the calendrical fuss I am against it. It is a form of whitewashing. Something I don't want anything to do with. I don't. What would you wish for? I am only speaking here of Germany, even though I know other contexts, but as a Jew in Germany I would wish that firstly, people don't speak to you about the past. Secondly, I would like to be able to be left alone to live in peace in the community as a Jew. Just as it was in Strasbourg where I lived for a long time, it was such a relief. The normality of a Jew going about his daily life, that is the astonishing thing, to go to town and shop, go to the theater, drive on the tram and go about his business in an ordinary fashion. And not to be asked during some hypocritical conversation about why I am wearing a kippah. I don't ask a Catholic priest why he wears a collar. And I wouldn't ask a nun walking around in her habit, why are you wearing that? But I am often asked. 
I have endless stories to tell. I wrote about this and I am going to repeat it. How can a policeman come to me and say that I provoke open annoyance because I am wearing the kippah? That lets me know exactly what kind of place I am living in. So they can save themselves the effort of all the commemorations and speeches. Ein Polizist, ich hatte es ja auch geschrieben und ich werde es wiederholen. Wie kommt ein Polizist dazu, mir zu sagen, ich errege öffentliches Ärgernis, weil ich die Kippe trage? Da weiß ich doch, wo ich bin. Da bleiben mir doch die Feiertagsreden, die können sich doch das alles sparen. Ja? Ich meine, das ist auch traurig. Auf der einen Seite natürlich diese Idee, wie, geht man, wie hat man Normalität nach dieser Monstrosität der Geschichte? Ja. It is so sad. How does one have normality after the monstrosity of history? And maybe as people who live overseas or who are not Jewish, we don't understand that. Because we are stuck in this story, which is always part of the dialogue. Could one hold this dialogue in such a way that this theme does not always hover in the background? And what would this mean? On the one hand, the dialogue wants to make the human visible, but on the other hand, it exactly does not achieve this. So als Untergrundrauschen immer da ist, weil es natürlich auch das Menschliche irgendwo auf der einen Seite sichtbar machen will, aber auf der anderen Seite genau das nicht tut. I have never expressed this with the kind of clarity as I want to do now. As a Jew, a Jude, a word I have in my ear when someone shouts from the balcony, there goes the Jude the rat. Right here in my own neighborhood. As a Jew, I have a very clear memory of how I grew up. I am still there. I do not want to be reminded in a hypocritical friendly dialogue of the following two things, that which was, and that I am still here. I don't want to be reminded of that by them. I expect that one could have taken over something from a role. I don't believe in enlightenment. But that a bit of the approach that Lessing introduced in Nathan, the wise. There is a form of inner freedom intended that is probably not completely satisfactory, but what was laid down as a basis, that is what I expect. This is obviously a misplaced hope. I want to make an example. When the famous actress from the Hamburg Thalia Theatre Ich erwarte, dass man ein bisschen was, ich glaube nicht an die Aufklärung, aber dass man ein bisschen was übernommen hätte aus dem Ansatz, der sich beim Lessing findet. Also da ist die Form einer Geistesfreiheit ja intendiert in diesem Stück. Die, Nata, ja, die, die sicher nicht umsetzbar ist, aber was da angelegt ist, das, darauf, das erwarte ich. Und das ist natürlich eine fehlgeleitete Hoffnung. Aber alles andere, ich will ein Beispiel machen, wenn die, die Moment, wie hat die geheißen, die große Schauspielerin aus der Hamburg, aus dem Thalia Theater, that one even considered to let Ida Eri read Paul Salan's death fugue in Parliament is an affront without equal. It was intended well, but it was an affront without equal. One should not do that. Why? It is as if one would let a guillotine fall and the head is off. And then one says to the head, sorry, we didn't really want it like this. I am sorry. If she had read a poem by Heine, Donna Clara. I, Senora, your beloved, am the son of the respected, erudite and noble Rabbi Israel of Saragossa. Jews and Moors, let us forget them, says the knight, with soft persuasion, and, into a grove of myrtle, guides the fair Alcalde's daughter. This one could do. In its song form, it is such a radical poem. It also clearly documents the contribution of Heinrich Heine to German literature in his separateness. 
but to recite the death fugue that was one voice too far in the context. Of course one can read it, but not in that context. <coughs> Und dann ist es auch ein interessanter Punkt, den Sie da natürlich nennen, weil es geht ja da auch darum, was für ein... That is interesting point that you make, because it is also about what position Jewish authors had in German literature and especially Heinrich Heine. So that is another point that may manifest inclusion. Ja, als ich in Israel war, 2019, bin ich an der Hebräischen Universität in Jerusalem, hatte ich ein Kolloquium zu machen. Und da war genau das ein Thema. Es ging darum, im Englischen um, um, yes. Jewish Arabic When I was in Israel in 2019, I was at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and I had to hold the colloquium. And exactly that was the topic. It was about Jewish heritage and legacy in German literature of today. And that was the theme that was given and it fits with what we are speaking about. By the way, Hans Ulrich Gumbrecht from Stanford was also there. We were both born in the same hospital we discovered, in the same city, just a few days apart. And there I was, in a Jewish context, speaking as a Jew, about Jewish heritage and legacy in German literature today. And that was not simple because we do have some Jewish contemporary writers, but that is not for a legacy yet. It only borders on heritage. Sometimes, what I was supposed to speak about in Jerusalem was that which was what happened before that legacy. What had been there before 1933. And that legacy made me reflect very, very, very deeply and has shaped me greatly. And that which I have in Jerusalem sprechen können sollen müssen, war das, was vor der war. Und das war eine Erfahrung, die mich sehr, sehr, sehr nachdenklich gemacht hat und sehr geprägt hat. And while I was there, I also held a lecture in the Jerusalem headquarters of the Leo Beck Institute. And there was an old Jewish lady. She was very, very old. And I was lecturing and I had translator who interpreted, and the lecture was also handed out in Hebrew. And suddenly I see that the fine old woman began to cry. After the lecture, she briefly came to me. She was an old German Jewish woman, and she said to me that this was the first time in a long time that she heard German poems. She had been unable to do this before. <laughs> deutsche Gedichte gehört, die das vorher nie können. Und, das hat sie mir dann erzählt, ich hatte ja verschiedene Veranstaltungen in Tel Aviv und in Jerusalem. Und was die Jerusalemer Situation angeht, sie war überall dabei. I had different events across Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, she came to all the events. She followed me around. At the Leo Beck lecture, there were also suddenly a whole lot of very young people in the audience. They could have been my grandchildren. Very young people. They also came to me. Then I suddenly realized that there were three to four generations in the room, the dead that are no longer there, for various reasons, the old ones that still came, the middle generation that participate in the Buber slash Rosenzweig Institute events or the Leo Beck ones. And then these young people who are in their 20s. And it did become clear that from the background of an own biography, I don't mean biographical writing, from the background of an own biography that to create something artistically that works through the language, that this makes sense that it has a meaning, that it is not meaningless. That was that experience. Coming back to the question, Germany, 
In Germany, I have experienced the aversion, the violence, the aggression, the institutionalized stupidity, the tolerance of these by the functionaries. They let it go through. They do not penalize these violations. I have experienced this myself. Twice I started proceedings and they were simply closed. Once I was threatened with a pistol and another time with a cleaver, and I went to the police, and they said, let's leave it alone. I told them that I would never go to them again. I am going to buy a gun, and if something happens, I am going to shoot the person in the knee. They will never forget that. They will limp their whole life. I will be convicted and go to jail for assault for three years on parole. And it will be worth the cause. But I will never turn towards the police again. And that what is so important. That is something very important to talk about. We talk about this ritualization. We are guests of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, and we will surely have a very interesting discussion about the importance of commemoration. We naturally think that through commemoration, through the constant reappraisal of the past, we resolve these conflicts. But there always is an undercurrent. These rituals affect people differently, and it sometimes feels as if this memorialization doesn't work as it should. It doesn't work. And what I have told you really happened. And not just once, but a few times. This does not make me bitter. There are other words for it. It does not make me bitter, but I have no faith in the institutions. I am convinced that if political changes were to happen in a certain direction, then that which we have behind us will repeat itself. I don't believe in institutionalized tolerance, to put it that way. One could make a whole film about what I could tell you. I am looking after my mother who is 94, and I am trying to get some information from the director of the nursing home, and he says, stop your Jewish gesture. I'm in a lift, my mother is in the hospital. I am going up and the nurse comes in and says, are you Jewish? Are there still Jews around? In our village there aren't any anymore. Ich fahre im Krankenhaus mit dem Aufzug, steigt die Krankenschwester ein und sagt zu mir, sind Sie Jude? Dann sage ich, ja. Gibt es die noch? Es ist, es ist uns, es ist bei uns im Dorf gibt es keine mehr. Ja. Such incidents happen ja, everywhere. Then I don't need these calendar ja, celebrations. I don't want them. I don't believe a word of what is being said. This is so awful what you are telling us. Coming back to your poetry, as you work through language, is this a way to create a new identity through new language? To find some kind of solace in a poetic utopia amongst all this aggression, this lack of protection? No. Within the poetic construct, I try to attempt the truthful reproduction. There is no solace. I once wrote that it is all completely inconsolable. It is absolutely inconsolable. But something strange happens. I would say that it is not any escapism. Aber durch die diachrone Gestaltung eines bestimmten Geschehens mit der gerade so musikalischen... But through the diachronic crafting of a certain event that goes along with a musical alteration of themes, a fullness of time and materiality is enabled. And this offers resistance against the synchronicity of the concealed horror. That is how I can say, 
and this enables me while I am reading, and especially if I read it out, and the things are made so that one reads them again, hears them again, and once again. To think about what is written here, why is it written in this way, and not differently. Dann kann für je, im glücklichsten Fall, für je einen Einzelnen, der Gender kriegt man ja nicht, aber für je einen Einzelnen, die Möglichkeit... In the best case, this means that for each one of the listeners, there can be the possibility, for example, to hear something individualized. I can give you an analogy, Gustav Mahler's music of the songs of the death of children. One can hear the music individualized. The piece has been played thousands of times and listened to. For me, when I hear them, they become my personal songs of the death of children. A poem can achieve the same. For me, there are real sound environmental imaginations that flow into the linguistic expression. That influence what I can do with it. Or another example from the visual arts. If you look at the paintings of Francis Bacon, you first see the depiction of a human slaughterhouse and cage. But if you look carefully, and I have done that often and patiently, these works by Bacon display such extraordinary technique that has hardly been surpassed by anyone in his era. I know that Lucian Freud is a smudger compared to this, who wants to impress with the superficial depiction of rotting bodies. It is laughable. Also like Abramovich. That is silly. <coughs> Whereas Bacon depicts the property of beauty, how the disaster of its woundedness is inherent in that beauty, that lies inside the beauty depicted or shown, not depicted as it is not theatre. And these fine constructed lines in these pictures, we should talk about this at another time. This is a form of Baroque ornamentation that plays its role. That is a whole other story. That leads to somewhere else. But I wanted to make this comparison. Because if I place pictures next to my poems, then I would turn to Bacon's paintings. For example, because I see correspondences, yes, this is how I could say this. That is fine. So in principle, there is solace in the vulnerability? Yes. Yes, this is how one can say that. It is a very lonely solace. Also subscribe to the existentiality of the human condition. Yes, it is what Beckett calls to keep failing. It is exactly that. I don't know I was 22 or 23. In one night, I never forgot that. I always worked on pieces of paper. Until today. In the meantime, they became famous, these pieces of paper. I wrote in the night, somewhere between two and three. Even the failure has to succeed. And that is one of those themes. Then later I found this Beckett sentence about failing once again. Or, let's leave it for now. Let's leave it for now. <laughs> I think we offered our listener enormous food for thought. Let's leave it for now. Mm. Thank you for that conversation again. Wow. Um, so at this point in time, I would like to invite Raina once again to, to read a poem to us. Oh, um, you're muted. Uh, 
I would like to a bit uh, in that. Would you please say some words concerning Dreistücke uh, in Volkstone, Winterreise? Please. Okay. Yeah, if you want to, after of all, course, pardon, I can. Pardon, pardon. After all, the, after all the, this that I saw immediately, it's It's not in the simple sense, uh, meaning flashback, but it hurts me. And I would like to, to, to beg you to, to say some words concerning Winterreise, and then I will read, yes? It's okay? Yeah, it's also okay if you decide not to read it, it's fine as well. I will read, I will read, yes, I will, um, yeah. Actually, um, that was not translated. There were not many English translations that we had, and Winterreise is a winter's journey is a part of a triptych that um, and we choose um, we, we we chose to use it because we could from what we were talking actually about memory about how past present future are condensed in memory and how they actually are beyond time and um, individual experience and I felt that this poem shows actually exactly what um, what Rainer was talking about and how his experience actually is turned into literature and, and ex excavates a deeper meaning of what we go through. I don't know if this makes sense Rainer and yeah. It does, it does. <coughs> I will read the German version. <coughs> Winterreise. Vom Aufgang der Sonne bis zu ein aus. Dazwischen ein Kyrie Teil. Was bitte hilft dem da? Da geht der Jud die Ratte. Und unseren kranken Nachbarn auch. Dass sowas wie du hier überhaupt gehen darf. Und unseren kranken Nachbarn auch. Von fern her Berlin, große Hamburger Straße, da in die Leguster scheißen die Hunde. Mendelssohns Denkmal, Denkstein steht auch hier welch ein Gedenken. Vom Aufgang, Morgenstunden, ihrem Untergang zu nichts. Oh. Winter Journey. There is no picture. Ah, there is. Okay, I see. Winter Journey. from the rise of the sun till it's in and out in between part of a curie. What, please, how does it help that one there walks a Jew with a rat. And our ailing neighbors too. That someone like you is even allowed to walk here. And our ailing neighbors too. From far, 
Große Hamburger Straße, Judenhaus. There, the dog shit in the privates, Mendelssohn Memorial Stone still stands. Also, here, what a memorization. From the rise of morning hours, it's sinking towards nothing. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Rainer. I guess we should ask for the resonance, Mdu. Yes, um, at this point in time, I thought, I think it's important for us to share how we feel right now. I'm going to ask everyone to just write on the chat. How do you feel right now? Perhaps think of a word, think of one word that can summarize the feeling, how you feel right now after having listened to, to that poetry, and that interviews, the conversation, the two conversations that we've, we've experienced. Please tell us how you feel right now. Please just write, write on the chat. Could be one word, could be a sentence. How do you feel? Um, so, Lynn is saying disturbed. It's an interesting word. Um, and Susan Harris is saying despair. And we have Tali who's saying conflicted. Um, and then Jeffrey Davis says uplifted yet great sadness. Everything changes, but nothing changes. Um, and then we have Mickey Jacobs who says stunned and distressed. So it's a variety of feelings, it's a, but it's, it's, it's deep feelings and troubling feelings and, and disturbing. And I wonder, um, uh, so Jeffrey saying, not Jeffrey, Hedy Davis. Um, um, so it's an interesting response from people from listening to that poetry and listening to, to, to that testimony. My, I have a question that has just come to me and it's about vulnerability versus solace. So you spoke about that vulnerability can be solace, but it's a very um, lonely solace. Um, so the, someone is asking, can you speak more about that relationship between vulnerability and solace. Soll ich das übersetzen? Kann mir jemand das geschwind übersetzen? Ja, ich wollte, habe jetzt eine Frage. Ja, ja es geht also darum. Ich habe verstanden, etwa so verstanden, es ist die Rede von sehr viel Vereinzelung, Alleinsein. Es geht, es, geht, es geht um die Idee, also dass in der Verletzlichkeit auch ein Trost liegt und inwieweit dass diese Einsamkeit, die in dieser Verletzlichkeit liegt, ob du dazu mehr sagen kannst. Ich denke, ich denke Verletzlichkeit und oder Verletzbarkeit, was unterschiedlich ist. Und das, es geht nicht um Loneliness, aber das Alleinsein damit, das alleine macht noch keinen Grund für zum Beispiel ein Gedicht oder ein Musikstück, weil beides immer auf Dialog angelegt ist. So vulnerability or rather saying being vulnerable um, 
and make uh, might make lonely but in this loneliness that's not a reason to to make a poem or um, work with a poem mm. yes thank you for that um i'm going to invite everyone else to please uh post your questions on the chat and um and then we'll address them to 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 Raina. So thank you for that for that explanation between um, vulnerability and solace. So Indra, I'm going to hand over to you. I don't know if you have any any questions. <laughs> Even though it felt I did nothing, but somehow we had the whole conversation. Um, I mean, for me, it's interesting because we do have other German people around. I mean, for me as a German, I find this incredibly, I'm incredibly ashamed. And the interesting thing is that there is this whole layer of commemoration, this stepping stones, everybody is so, all the Jewish museums, and we deal with this. But on the other hand, there is a person really dealing with, I mean, things you, I would have never believed that they still happen. You know, and then I, the, the, the despair I can just, that's behind this and the cruelty and this, I mean, it just makes me speechless actually. Mm. So, yeah. Mm. Um, we have a question from, from Tali. Yeah, I, it's just too much to write. So I, I, I want to, to process. Um, Austria was silent. Austria did not do commemorations or museums, yet anti-Semitism is still there in Austria. Um, Germany did, and my reflection is, is, silent, is silence better? Is your poem the same as the speeches? you are saying, you know, the fact, and a museum in Berlin will say the fact. So I'm sort of struggling with, with the reaction to disaster, <coughs> reaction to catastrophe. Should you keep silent? Should you write novels and poems? Can you do museums and memorials? What do we do? as a society of perpetrators. So Tali fragt, wenn man aus der Sicht der, um, ist es uh, aus der ich Sicht? Ich habe es so weit verstanden. Okay, okay. Ja. Darf ich, es wird vielleicht ein bisschen Deutsch sein, ein bisschen Englisch. <lacht> First of all, ich möchte nicht, dass meine Gedichte oder Dichtung nur unter diesem Aspekt des deutsch-jüdischen Verhältnisses verstanden wird. First. But, because the question is concerning uh, Austria. Uh, we spoke about uh, Korn, Blum and Blau. Someone should know that before 1938, diese wunderbare kleine blaue Blume das geheime Kennzeichen am Revers war der frühen österreichischen Nazis oder Faschisten. Um, Rainer, can I quickly translate? Yes, yes, Otherwise, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, risk yeah. of all, yeah, he says yeah. he doesn't want. Yeah, to... I wrote it. That... <laughs> <laughs> so, first of all, he doesn't want to have his poetry reduced simply to be to deal with the German Jewish relationship, obviously. And secondly, he talks about the poem that he read, the Vater, uh, Vaterland Cornflower Blue, because that blue cornflower was actually um, a sign that the Nazis in Austria and pre before Nazi time used as a sign to indicate that they were belong to this group. So it has very much also he dealt very much with this in that poem. Ich denke, ich denke, dass es durchaus gut ist, ich sage nicht sinnvoll, ich sage gut, <lacht> dass es Orte des Gedenkens gibt. There should be places, 
for memorial reasons. Aber wie jedes Denkmal, die in der Regel statisch sind, gibt es danach keine Bewegung mehr. Bitte. So he said that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be memorials. They might be good, but they might not be, it might not be sensible. But one very important point is that they are static. And when there is no static, there's no dynamic. And then that becomes like something that doesn't flow, that doesn't open. And im Verhältnis zwischen der Bundesrepublik Deutschland und Österreich, ich denke, bitte, ich bin auf der einen Seite ganz nah bei dem, was zeitgenössisch in der Literatur passiert, auf der anderen Seite habe ich einen großen Abstand. Wenn, und ich bin gleich zu Ende, wenn zum Beispiel Eva Menasse jetzt über einen Nazi-Exzess in Rechnitz, Österreich, Ende des Krieges, einen Roman schreibt, ich halte es für absolut degutant. Es ist jenseits jeder historischen, ich will gar nicht weiterreden, lassen wir. Okay, so when he looks into, um, into it from, he is very much knowledgeable about contemporary writing and sometimes some pieces he acknowledged, others not, and he just mentioned Eva Menasse, she's an Austrian, a Jewish Austrian writer. Um, and she wrote and she wrote recently published a novel about um, incidents that happened after the war in Austria and he doesn't agree with this. I mean, in the way Reinhard doesn't agree, <laughs> he doesn't like it and he found it appalling actually. So yeah, you, you want to add more to it or just we leave it like this? Wir lassen es. <laughs> Wir lassen es. <lacht> Was soll ich tun? Was soll ich tun? What should I do? But it's interesting, you know, because what I thought actually to open this, um, when we look, because we talked about Max Czolek, and yeah. I find it very interesting that among younger Jews and I know of a lot of Israeli Jews, I mean, people in their 20s, 30s that follow, see German roots and they move to Berlin. It's, it's quite fashionable right now. And out of this comes, of course, a completely different way of relating to the past. So it's, of course, not static. And there could be an interesting dialogue to open it up. But, you know, as long, and this is what I feel when, after we had this interview as well, and when reading your poetry, the despair that beyond that surface of where everything is lovely, um, there is such a deep unappreciation for the past that the Germans still show, a lot of Germans show, and this is painful. And this is maybe an Israeli who now moves to Berlin into a bubble, probably doesn't realize, even though it's not true anymore, actually, because I know a lot of Israeli Jews living in Berlin that are constantly harassed, but yeah. I will, I will answer first of German. Ich, ich kenne diese Bewegung, dass viele junge Israelis nach Berlin kommen. Das hat sicher mit der soziablen Freiheit dieser Stadt zu tun und der großen Community, die da ist. Aber ich bitte darum, einfach wahrzunehmen. Also es ist etwas gefährlich, wenn ich das so sage. Aber bitte, wenn man sich... Ich, ich habe jeden Tag mindestens vier israelische Zeitungen auf meiner Timeline. Ich weiß, was passiert. <lacht> für die jungen Leute ist es schlecht. Also wenn sie es sich irgend leisten können, es geht. Aber für viele junge Leute ist es schlechterdings unmöglich, die teuren... Lebenssituation in Israel noch zu ertragen. Und viele wechseln woanders hin und viele davon gehen als junge Leute nach Berlin, weil 
erstens eine große jüdische Gemeinde in verschiedenen Schattierungen in Berlin da ist, aber das Leben für die jungen Leute bezahlbar ist. Es ist eine Frage sozusagen einer reziproken Überlebensmöglichkeit, weil sie zu Hause, sie müssen im Zelt auf der, auf der Platz übernachten, um zu protestieren. Man muss sich das einmal vorstellen. Das hat gar nichts zu tun mit der deutsch-jüdischen Geschichte. So maybe can I quickly translate? It's interesting ja. because um, what he, what, what Rainer actually is saying that, I mean, he, from what he's read about and he, he subscribed to Israeli newspapers is that, um, that all these young people actually come and move to Germany has not only into this city of Berlin, that's of course very different, um, has not only to do with discovering the roots or with the past, but it has also to do very much that life in Israel is so expensive that for young people there is no chance to stay there. So that Berlin in Berlin life is actually cheaper and they can afford to stay there. Wow. Is that we have a question a... one? Oh. No? Yes. Is there any question once more? <clears throat> uh, there's simply a comment. Uh, maybe you would like to address this comment, which is kind of challenge, which is very challenging. It's from um, uh, Jeffrey Davis. Hedy. Uh, Hedy. Hedy Davis. Okay. <laughs> and um, she's saying there are no solutions. Nazism, apartheid, hatred between races, they have always been there and they will never go away. We may wish it away, but there will always be friction. It's a comment. Is there anything you'd like to say to address that maybe? Maybe we should read another poem. The, the one that we chose fits very well. One calls it bliss. Ah. <laughs> Ach, nein, nein, nein. Ich möchte noch kurz zur, zur letzten Frage oder so etwas. Ich mache, ich lese das. Vor dem Hintergrund meiner Geschichte, die ja, wenn man es die für sich genommen nicht so besonders ist, aber aufgrund der familiären Konstellation doch eine gewisse Besonderheit hat. <lacht> mein, ich sage jetzt wirklich im vollen Sinne, künstlerisches, mein Wort künstlerisches Interesse oder das Ziel meiner Arbeit ist sicher ausgelöst durch die bestehende gesellschaftliche Situation, aber sagen wir, the aim, the aim of all is to create a certain form which is not touchable. There is a wonderful sentence of Ingeborg Bachmann on German, it's haltet Abstand von mir oder ich morde. That's all. Keep distance from me or I will. I, I will read this in another, in another poem. Yes, I will yeah. do. Yeah. Was? You call it, you call it, yes. I will read it first in English. Uh, they call it bliss. Yes, I see. It. They call it bliss. They call it bliss maybe grieve too, they call it bliss to blow off umbels in June, elder 
etc. All that crawls and flies, they call it bliss. Hailstorm and the cherry trees, there is a buzzing in the air when you walk around the church here, a few steps, then everything falls down on you briefly before the lime blossoms burst, then I gently chirp as house crickets do. In quotation, you are found always, you are one. They call it bliss. They call it bliss moved the passing also as if nothing and yet everything is there, observed, seen, to lay one in the other like two seashells, Saint Jacques, that as well that grow close, they call it bliss. I would like to read it once more. They call it bliss. They call it bliss, maybe grieve too. They call it bliss to blow, to blow off umbels in June, elder, etc. All that crawls and flies, they call it bliss. Hailstorm in the cherry trees, there is a buzzing in there when you walk around the church here, a few steps. Then everything falls down on you briefly before the time blossoms burst, then I gently chirp as house crickets do. <clears throat> In quotation, you are found always. You are one. They call it bliss. They call it bliss, move the passing also as if nothing and yet everything is there, observed, seen to lay one in the other like two seashells, Saint Jacques, that as well to grow close, they call it bliss. <clears throat> German, if you like, man nennt es Glück. Man nennt es Glück, vielleicht auch Trauer. Man nennt es Glück, das Hinhauchen von Dolden im Juni, Holunder, etc., das Ganze. Es fleucht und kreucht. Man nennt es Glück. Den Hagelschlag in die Kirchen. Es ist ein Sirren in der Luft, wenn du um die Kirche gehst hier wenige Schritte, dann fällt dich alles an. Kurz nur, bevor die Lindenblüten platzen, dann zirp ich leise, wie es Heimchen tun. Im Zitat findest dich immer. Du bist eins. Man nennt es Glück. Man nennt es Glück, das Ergriffene, das Ableben auch so als wäre nichts. Und doch, alles ist da, beobachtet, gesehen. Liegen ineinander wie zwei Muschelschalen, Saint-Jacques, auch das. Ein Heranwachsen. Man nennt es Glück. Dankeschön. Thank you. Thank you, Rainer, for, for those readings and for that poetry and for, for making us think in different ways. 
And one of the interesting things I read towards the, this event was the, the phrase injured language and, and linked to survival's guilt. So I've, I've thought about it very differently now, the way you've expressed it. I've been thinking, and I think you've made a lot of people really think in a different way about guilt and about the language we use when we speak about memory and especially yeah, memory of yeah, traumatic yeah, events. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much. Um, are there any, any, any last words? To say, yes. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. And Indra, are there any last words from you? No, I thank you so much and for that opportunity and that such an important voice can be heard. And we really plan to do, you know, you heard the last part of the triptych, but it is a triptych and it will be translated and there will be exciting things happening. So in future, so I hope we can come back with Raina. That would be so much my pleasure. And thank you all for coming and hopefully we see you again in October for our next event. Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, Raina, we bleiben noch zum debrief. <laughs> I, I should stay here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes <I really. laughs>